and welcome to Men of the Word, a ministry at Calvary Chapel Heartland in Fort Valley, Georgia. Our church is located about three miles west of Interstate 75 off of Exit 142 on Highway 96. I am Greg Cannington, your host. Here at Calvary Chapel, we study the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, because we need the Word of God in context. The Word of God contained in both the Old and the New Testament. That's our sole doctrine here at Calvary Chapel Heartland. Three of our weekly ministries, our Bible studies, are also available online through YouTube and our Facebook channels. That begins with our Sunday service, at, which is at 10.30, for our senior pastor, Jerry. He's just finished up studying the Gospel of Mark. And this Men of the Word ministry that you're looking at right now, we have our in-person meeting every Tuesday morning at Chick-fil-A on Watson Boulevard at 6.30. This way, the men that have work to, to go to, they can go have a Bible study and then go to work. What a great way to start the day. <clears throat> In addition, we have a Wednesday evening Bible study with Pastor Phil Snyder, which is currently in the book of Numbers. So you see, we study both Old and New Testaments. <clears throat> Just remember, we always invite you to join in person if you can, if you're in the area. But if you can't, or you miss a study, you can catch up on the YouTube channel or our Facebook page and just go to our website and you'll see all the announcements about the times and all the things that are going on in our church. We have other ministries that aren't online, but they include our Misfit Student Ministries, which at 6 o'clock on Friday evenings with Pastor Kirk and his wife Amy. And we also have Evening Men of the Word on Tuesday evenings, the second and fourth Tuesday, with Pastor Aaron, currently in the book of First Chronicles. And a morning and ladies Bible study, the first and third Tuesday, all here at the church at the, in the Calvary Cafe where I am right now. Like I said, you just go to our website and you can find all the information that you need. But before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lift this study up to you, Lord. We thank you for this time together studying the truth, the truth in your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us today and lead us in understanding the deeper meanings of your word so that we all may enter into a closer personal relationship with your Son and our Savior, our Lord Jesus. All this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this is the fifth week that we've been into 1 Corinthians, but I think it's worthy right now to cover up a little rewind. Let's go back and look at what we've, what's so far. In the first and second chapters, the Apostle Paul begins identifying and providing corrections some, for some behaviors that have been reported to him. Things like divisions between which leader or pastor individuals were following here at the church in Corinth, whether it was Apollos or Peter or Paul, rather, but the point he makes, it's Christ that we should be following. It doesn't matter who sowed the word, who brought the word to you. They are servants. You don't follow them, you follow Christ. It was Christ and him crucified that saved you. Chapter 2 continued with identifying the difference between the wisdom of man or mankind and that the natural man, and I say that in quotations because that's what the word says, cannot understand the spiritual things of God because they seem foolish to him. It's only because it's a spiritual word. Those who are saved and believe in Jesus have a deeper understanding because they have the presence of the Holy Spirit living within them doesn't mean you're not saved, but 
you're immature. And that's exactly what he says in, uh, in chapter 3. These mature, immature Christians are, are carnal. They're saved, but they're not ready to hear the word. And the Apostle Paul uses things like, I fed you with milk. You were not ready for solid food. In chapter 4, he reminded the Corinthian church that he and the other apostles are the people that bring the mysteries of God to the people. And as such, they are given and held to a much higher standard by God himself, which is true of any pastor or teacher. You're held under a, a higher accountability than anyone else because it's a responsibility that you're responsible for to be accurate in what you say. That's why it's so important to study the Word yourself. Just because someone says it, read it for yourself. That's why Bible studies is, are so important. And he, Apostle Paul went on to say in chapter 4 that not to get puffed up or fool yourselves. Never consider yourself higher than your brethren or as the source of all this glorious thing that you have through salvation and how God has worked in your life. It has nothing to do with you. It's all God. God and Him alone is where these blessings come from. So now open up your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and let's open the Word of God together as the Apostle Paul addresses immoral activities going on in the church in Corinth. Chapter 5, verse 1. <clears throat> it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Whoa. The Greek word used here for sexual immorality is pornea, from which we get the words pornography. You have to understand, too, that this same Greek word is used in many places in the New Testament and can refer to any number of sexually immoral acts, homosexuality, bestiality, anything like that, uh, things that are forbidden in uh, Ten Commandments, such as adultery, that sort of thing. But it's all pornea in the Greek. And <clears throat> you also understand in the city of Corinth, it was notorious for their sexual immorality amongst the Greek population. Now, the church there also had Jewish believers, but I suspect it appears that the majority were Greek. So, and he points out, this act of a man having sex with his father's wife, stepmother, we assume, wasn't even done there in a place that was so wicked is it, from sexual and moral acts because this was the place that they worshipped the false goddess Aphrodite. And there were temple prostitutes that descended on the city every evening to have sex to raise money for the temple. But it was not to be so amongst the Christian followers. Paul understood that this incestuous relationship being considered taboo even among the pagans of that culture, yet the Corinthian church had seemed to be accepting it. He continues, verse 2, And you, he says, are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absence in the body but present in spirit, having already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. So you have to ask yourself, do you think that perhaps the Corinthians were allowing this behavior 
they were showing themselves to be tolerant and loving. You know, we are called as Christians to love the sinner but hate the sin. Think about what's going on in our society today. Think about the things that were unheard of to even be spoken about 10 years ago. And yet, we see it everywhere we turn. For the Christian, these things that we know through the Word of God are wrong. There's, we cannot accept that behavior as normal. Doesn't mean we don't love the people. Because we do. We should love all. We should pray for everyone. Not one of us is without sin. The Word says so. Every one of us. Me, you, everyone. But we don't, when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, we want to become more and more like Him. So, we should be sinning less. We will still stumble. But Jesus is there to forgive us and set us back on the path of righteousness. That's what we're called to do. Whims of society are here today and gone tomorrow. And it's really interesting, the things that Paul is talking about here, and he talks about in some of his other epistles, so closely resemble what's going on in our world today and in this nation, where things that were considered taboo are no longer taboo, or seem to be in society, yet for the Christian who are we to follow? The whims of man or the Word of God? Pretty simple. Paul goes on to say in verse 4, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my Spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now Paul, he, when he says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he's reinforcing his apostolic authority to call out the sin as unacceptable. Once again, love the sinner, but hate the sin. And he says that, delivering to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved. If he's truly saved, though he sins, he doesn't become unsaved. So what he's saying is, you know, let that work itself out. Let the sin itself be punishment. He goes on to say, and I think this is one of the more important parts, your glory glorying, he says to the Corinthian church, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may have a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. Now, what he's talking about here in the scriptures, leavened means to be that synonymous with sin, as in leavening of bread with, that, with the yeast, it causes a decay or rot, which creates the gas that leavens the bread. And for the Jews, before the Passover, they're to, they purge their homes of any unleaven, any leaven, so that what they're having is untainted. So this is he drawn this parallel here that this allowing this to go on within the church is going to result in other corruption within the church. You know, you hang out with the wrong sort of people, guess what? You'll pick up their habits. And this is such a serious thing that Paul gets really straight with them. He doesn't pull any punches. And if you noticed, as we've gone through so far in Corinthians, he didn't start out with this major thing. He sort of eased into it. And I think that was on purpose. 
if you got a letter from someone that jumped down your throat right away, like he's doing here, you may not be so interested in, in uh, what you have to say. So Paul corrects some more minor things. Not that they were minor, but they're not as terrible as this. And he's teaching the whole time. John MacArthur, and I, I use my John MacArthur's uh, study Bible a lot, he said, turning such a person out of fellowship will not, so it will not be an evil influence with the church. What else could they do? But pray for his repentance, which is what Paul had just said. And he continues, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast of the Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb, the perfect. Let us keep the feast, not of old leaven, nor with leaven of malice or wickedness. And that's what he's talking about here, wickedness. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What Paul is doing right here, he's sincere about this. And it's serious. But he's given them the truth. Jesus, as our Passover lamb, was the sacrifice for all of us. Our clean sins have been cleansed if you're a believer in Jesus. Don't we also, today, each one of us here, have to be vigilant and purge the leaven from our lives, the sin? Yes. It's interesting that what was happening here and what's happening in the ancient world in Corinth is no different what's happening today. And in the Ecclesiastes, King Solomon said the same thing. There's nothing new under the sun. And it proves it. Right here, right now. Verse 9. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly do not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters since you wouldn't need to go out in the world. Now what he's saying here, he, didn't, he was talking about the ch people within the church, those who were followers of Jesus Christ not to keep company with immoral people. But he can't address the people who are outside of the church, the unsaved, the unwashed, the uncleansed. He's addressing the church. And he's saying, if I did that, I, you would have to go out. Of, we would need to go out of the world. And we're not to be part of this world. We have to live in it, but we haven't, can't be part of it. And that's his point. Yes, we are citizens of the world. We live in it. But we are more, better said, that we are citizens of heaven because we are followers of Jesus Christ. And that's how we have to think of it. And that's what Paul is saying. Now, I read some commentary that when Paul said, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, it might seem like he's talking about a previous letter. Wouldn't be uncommon, but it isn't in the scriptures. Oh, we have two letters to the Corinthians in scripture. So it was certainly common for all, and those books on those letters are lost or they weren't important for the Holy Spirit to keep them within the canon. So these letters, and then David Guzik puts it this way, so such letters were not preserved by the Holy Spirit through the church. Verse 11, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, being a believer, who is sexually immoral or covetous, nor an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. 
And the purpose of all this is putting the man outside the spiritual protection and social comfort of the church was for the destruction of his flesh, not his body, but his rebellious flesh. And that's a quote out of uh, Dave Guzik's commentary in The Enduring Word. Let the consequences of his sin, his fleshly sin, and the hope that the results wallowing in the mire as a result of his sin will be destroyed and he'll be come back to the fold. And this reminds me so much, and I thought about this later while I was preparing this, doesn't that sound like the prodigal son story that Jesus told? In Luke chapter 15, the son went out into the world, wanted his inheritance first, went out into the world, lived riotous living, doing all sorts of wicked things till he ran out of his father's money. And there was famine in the land and he was feeding pigs. And he was covetous of the husks that the pigs got to eat till he came to his senses and returned to his father's house. And his father welcomed him because he was repentant. And it's the same thing that Paul is talking about here. Turn them out. You can't allow the corruption to spread within your church. Now this is not who doesn't sin. We're all sinners. And we acknowledge that. But this sort of thing that is continuous and it was really important and I should have mentioned it earlier but when he first said is has his wife his father's wife that's present tense means it's been ongoing you can't you can't have it it's really that simple doesn't mean we hate that person doesn't mean we ridicule them but there are Other scriptures that tell us exactly how you deal with church discipline. Verse 12. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside, which is a continuation, outside the church? Do you, Corinthian church, do you not judge those who are inside? Not judging like you would you judge people, judging behavior. We don't know what's in people's hearts. God does. It's not our it's not ours to do. But we have to judge what's right and what's wrong according to God's word. And we don't accept it. He goes on to say, But God, those outside, but those who who are outside, God judges. God will judge them. It's His prerogative. It's His right. He is the Almighty. Therefore, Paul says, put away from yourselves the evil person. And it's important to see that this is not just the first time Paul says that. Later on in who also, when he, Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Paul says, And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. You pray for their repentance. You try. You you talk to them. And there's very specific ways to do that. And we'll get to that in others in additional studies. But the point here is it is not malice that we're doing with this. We just cannot allow corrupt things to occur in our church. Just can't. We're a call to a higher calling and we're not to defile our temple, which is the Holy Spirit within us. My friends, if you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior, 
please do so now. Don't wait. No one knows how much longer we have, each one of us, on this earth. God has given us a free gift of eternal life. None of us deserve it. You can't earn it because it's grace. It's grace from God. All it takes is a simple prayer, accepting God's gift to all of mankind by accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. And confessing that Jesus has has paid for your sins and you repent of them. And He's paid your debt for all eternity. And He's granting you God's promise of eternal life by believing in your heart that Jesus is who He says He is and you, my friend, will be saved. I'm going to give a thanks and a shout out to my brother Kyle for recording, editing, and putting our video ministries on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Join us next week as we continue our journey through 1 Corinthians with chapter 6. Until then, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you.